I mean, 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21, he emphasizes the importance of staying on the path to entering the consummated kingdom, the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by making clear that the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. He makes clear, he, he, he emphasizes the importance of staying on the path by making clear that the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated, and as proof that the teaching about Christ's consummating return, that that wasn't some cleverly concocted fairy tale, he cites his eyewitness experience in the transfiguration event, and he cites the fact that the absolutely reliable scriptures testify to Messiah's coming in judgment, and thus testify to Christ's return. Then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, he takes even more direct aim at these false teachers that he's writing uh, to combat. He takes more direct aim at them and he says that they're devious and deadly. He says that many will follow their licentious ways and as a result the uh, Christianity, the, the gospel will be slandered or blasphemed. And he says they're motivated by greed. And then he adds that the condemnation for these false teachers from long ago... It will certainly come, uh, their claims to the contrary notwithstanding, their idea that they're not going to be judged and there is no consummating uh, return with a judgment, they're certainly going to be judged. And then where we were looking last week in chapter 2, verse uh, 4 through the first part of verse 10, he exposes as a lie the false teacher's claim or their suggestion that God will allow rebellion and sin to go unpunished, and he does that by reminding his readers or his audience of God's prior judgments against sin. He tells them and he, he, he lets them know that God didn't spare certain rebellious angels from judgment. He didn't spare the ungodly world of Noah's day from judgment. He didn't spare the godless, the godless cities of Sodom and Gomorrah from judgment. So why should anybody think that God will spare the false teachers and their followers from judgment? And on the other hand, God's sparing of righteous Noah and his family and his sparing of righteous Lot that shows that he knows how to rescue godly people from a trial of judgment, how to bring the faithful through that sifting event of judgment without condemnation. He knows that. So the bottom line is that there is every reason, there's every reason for his audience, the people to whom he's writing, for them to continue to resist the false teacher's encouragement to immoral living. Okay, because judgment is coming. It won't be indiscriminate. God knows how to bring the faithful, the, the godly, through the judgment. So they have every reason to not bite on what these guys are selling. So that's what, he, that's what he's about. Now, for the reasons I mentioned last week, I believe with the vast majority of commentators... That Peter's reference to the, the judgment of the rebellious angels is a reference to the traditional Jewish understanding at that time of Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And according to that understanding, sons of God, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, and Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, the sons of God who married and procreated with the daughters of men, they were fallen angels. I know how that strikes us, but that's how it was understood, and I think he is endorsing at least parts of that understanding. I, I explained that, you know, Peter, he need not be endorsing all aspects of that traditional understanding, because you had this understanding, and then it was elaborated on and all that. But he doesn't necessarily endorse all of that. He simply speaks of the angel's sin and their punishment. So it looks to me like he's endorsing, he may only be endorsing as true or affirming as true that angels married and procreated with humans and are held in final judgment in a dreadful spiritual realm as a consequence of having done so. Now, you say, well, that just strikes me as so bizarre. One possible way of that happening, it seems to me, and this idea is not original with me, is that the, the demons possessed human males and that they did this through possession. Okay, that's one possibility. And when we ended last week, I was mentioning that Matthew 22, verse 30, it doesn't rule out that scenario of, you know, procreating, marrying, and procreating with, with humans. Because in Matthew 22, his statement that angels neither marry nor are given in marriage, it may refer only to faithful angels as opposed to fallen angels. 
and it may refer only to what happens in heaven rather than on earth. All right, so that's, that's my understanding. I said that there are some people, uh, I don't know how many today, but there are some people who apply what Peter is saying to the initial fall. And I explain there are four or five reasons that lead most people away from that to think that Peter is in fact endorsing aspects of the common Jewish understanding of Genesis 6 at that time. But don't, don't get hung up on that and lose sight of the point. Okay, the point is, he says, listen, if God judged these rebellious angels and cast them into Tartarus, if he judged the ungodly world of Noah's day, and if he incinerated Sodom and Gomorrah, why in the world would you think that you're going to escape judgment? Uh, you, if you follow the false teachers, that's what, that's what he's after. Now, as I noted in teaching First Peter, which was last quarter or whenever it was, and I'm sure you won't remember this, but in First, in first Peter, accepting the view, if one accepts the view uh, that, this is the, that this is the meaning of Genesis chapter 6, that Peter at least adopts in part, if you accept that view, it doesn't require you to conclude that 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 refers to a declaration made to those imprisoned angels. That's why most people, when I was teaching 1 Peter 3, I gave you my understanding of it, and I said that my understanding in that case was a minority position. Most people believe, most uh, commentators believe, that that 1 Peter chapter 3 where he, he preached to spirits in prison, they believe it's the same group of these imprisoned fallen angels and that, God, that Christ in his ascension was declaring victory over them. Okay, so I'm saying here in 2 Peter, I think Peter's talking about that in 2 Peter. I don't think he was talking about that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. In other words, one can have the view that, yes, I see that was the dominant Jewish view of Genesis chapter 6, and I think Peter's endorsing aspects of that in 2 Peter, and not necessarily conclude that in 1 Peter 3, he's also talking about that. All right, here's, uh, here's what Wayne Grudem says on it in his commentary. He says, our understanding, he's talking about the 1 Peter 3 text. Our understanding of this point is not crucial about uh, them undertaking Genesis chapter 6 uh, with the traditional Jewish understanding. He says, for one could be convinced that Peter's readers all thought, he's talking about 1 Peter, all thought that Genesis 6, 2, and 4 referred to fallen angels who took human wives and still hold that 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20 spoke of human beings who disobeyed during the building of the ark. Peter does not, of course, say he preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed by marrying human women, but rather spirits who disobeyed when the ark was being built. Now, if you don't remember what I said about 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, then you'll be going, what's he talking about? But I at least wanted to cover that base because if you did remember, you'd say, well, how is what you're telling me today fit with that? So I wanted to touch that before we carry on. All right, chapter 2. Now, the second part of verse 10 through verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 2, second part of verse 10 through 16. He says, brazen, arrogant men, they do not tremble when they revile glories, Whereas angels, though being greater in strength and power, do not bring against them a reviling judgment before the Lord. But these men, like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct born for capture and destruction, reviling those about whom they're ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering harm as wages of unrighteousness. Considering indulgence in the daytime a pleasure, they are blots and blemishes, indulging in their pleasures while feasting with you, having eyes full of desire for an adulteress, and that do not cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having hearts trained in greed, they are accursed children. Abandoning the straight way, they've gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, son of Basar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but had a rebuke for his own transgression." A speechless donkey speaking with a human voice restrained the prophet's madness. All right, back to the first, uh, the first part here of that, of that section. Uh, chapter 2, verses 10, 10, second part of 10 through 16. Now, the false teachers here, they're, they're so arrogant. You know, they're so arrogant that they don't fear when they blaspheme or revile glories. They don't fear when they blaspheme or revile glories, meaning when they mock them. 
when they ridicule them, when they belittle them, when they speak contemptuously of them. They, they don't even tremble. They're not even afraid of blaspheming and reviling these glories. Now, it seems, it seems clear, as most commentators recognize, that glories here, that's a literal thing. What he says is revile glories. Now, I don't know what your translation does with it. Uh, some try to you know, interpret that for you. But most understand here that, that glories refers to some kind of angelic being. You see, and though angels aren't referred to as glories in the Old Testament, they're linked with glory and actually called glories in some extra-biblical Jewish literature. So it looks like when he's talking about glories, it seems pretty clear that he's referring to angelic beings, but it's less clear, is he referring to faithful angels or is he referring to fallen angels, demons? Where he says that these people here, they're arrogant men. They do not tremble when they revile glories. Now, many people say, well, I don't think fallen angels could qualify for the label glories. But many people believe that that label, it may reflect the glory of their original state rather than, the glory, rather than their present condition. Okay, stick with me because I think this is, at least it's interesting to me here. Now, in Jude, in, in Jude verses 8 and 9, the archangel Michael, he is contrasted with the false teachers Jude's dealing with. Okay, so you have the false teachers there that Jude's dealing with, and, and the archangel Michael's contrasted with them in that they revile glories. The false teachers there, they revile glories, whereas Michael the archangels refused to bring a reviling judgment against Satan, instead saying, the Lord rebuke you. So there we have a contrast. The false teachers there refuse to bring a reviling judgment, or they refuse to, I mean, they revile glories, whereas Michael refuses to revile glories. They revile glories, he refuses to bring a reviling judgment against Satan. So it seems the contrast there, clearly they, they do it, he won't do it. So there are the glories, it seems Satan is picked out as one of these glories, Okay, so then, then in 2 Peter, then in chapter 2, verse 11, you have this relationship between 2 Peter and Jude. So the statement then in 2 Peter 2, 11, that angels do not bring a reviling, glory, a reviling judgment against them, it most likely then means, see here, where it says, whereas angels do not bring against them a reviling judgment. Well, you have over there, Michael the archangel and Jude refuses to bring this reviling judgment against Satan. Whereas these false teachers will bring, they will revile glories. So it seems here what he means is that the angels do not bring against the demonic a reviling judgment. Against these fallen powers. That even angels, just like Michael would say, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't bring a, a reviling judgment against these glories. So that it seems that he's saying that there, that, that when he says these angels, whereas angels do not bring against them a reviling judgment. He's talking about the angels will not bring against fallen angels a reviling ju judgment. And then that gives us the clue when he says, brazen, arrogant men, they do not tremble when they revile glories. What are they talking about? He's talking about when they, when they speak contemptuously and belittle fallen angels, the demonic. Okay, now, you know, if you watch Channel 21 and some of these people on TV, you may be going, well, that seems to be the way to go is to talk like this. But apparently it's not if I'm tracking this right. You say, okay, well, what is he saying? What is the point? Here's what I think Peter is saying in, in, in 2, 10, and 11. He's saying that these false teachers, they're so cocky in their error, so sure of themselves, so arrogant, that they react to warnings that their immorality is playing into the hands of the spiritual forces of evil. People are telling them that. That you are falling in prey to the spiritual forces of evil. They're warning them and they react to those warnings about that by uh, scoffing at the idea. And speaking of demons in, in skeptical, mocking, and scornful terms. People are trying to tell them. Listen, do you know that by encouraging this stuff, you are walking down the path. You are being taken by spiritual forces of evil and you're falling right into their hands and it... <laughs> Yeah, it's ridiculous. That's absurd. Spiritual forces my eye. And I could go on with other things. And you can imagine how somebody would be doing that. 
And they're just so certain, you see, that this idea of living in sexual immorality, no, 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 that's the way to go. And I think that when they're warned, they speak of these demons in skeptical, mocking terms and the recklessness of this arrogance. It's evident in the fact that even though good angels are more powerful than the demonic. And you can see that, for example, in Revelation 12, verses 7 and 8. They still have respect for the power of these beings. And perhaps even respect for the station from which they've fallen. And they do not speak insultingly or contemptuously of them. You say, why do you think that? Well, isn't that what Michael did? Right? Michael the archangel, he won't speak. They bring reviling judgments. And Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. Okay, so this idea, they won't do it. They won't speak that way. They oppose them, but they don't treat them lightly. They oppose them, will defeat them, but they don't treat them lightly, laugh at them scornfully, mock them. Ha, pff, there's nothing to worry about here. These people are paper, paper tigers. These forces, they either don't exist, they're a joke, you don't have to worry about them, they can have no effect on you, they're not plotting, they're not doing anything. Ah. They're smarter than that. These, the faithful angels realize that these forces are powerful. Now, we live in a world and a culture that says, no, no, no. There's no such thing as these things. You see, nah, you, you don't want to believe in any of that or think about any of that. I forget who it, who it was who said, you know, you can make two mistakes with, with the demonic realm. You can ignore it or you can fixate on it. You see? And I, I just, we need to be aware of a war that's going on. And we need to be aware of these people who think that, listen, I've come up with this great idea that justifies sexual immorality uh, look, they've been bagged. They have been caught by the enemy who is luring them, and they're so arrogant that they sit here and mock it. Oh, that's just crazy. Well, they're being devoured. <laughs> they're being devoured. So faithful angels, they oppose these beings, but they don't treat them lightly. They have a respect for their power and though they see themselves, these false teachers see themselves as the epitome of rationality and insight, right? Brazen Air, he says, though being, he says, these men like unreasoning animals, how do they see themselves? Well, you know, they're the deepest, the smartest, the brightest. They see themselves as the ultimate in rationality and insight. They are in their ignorant dismissal and reviling of these spiritual powers, laughing at them, treating as though it's nothing to be concerned about. Because if they're, even if they're real, they're nothing. They can't do a thing. Toothless, don't even worry about them. They're a joke. Oh, that's a bad attitude. <laughs> now, why is it a bad attitude? It's a bad attitude because it's dangerous. Because you have to be aware. You have to be aware of the battle, of the struggle that is going on. Why is Paul saying in Ephesians 6, put on your armor? Why? Because there's a spiritual war going on. Now, I don't like that. I, you know... We've shown that's not true. We have instruments that show it's not true. See, we've, we've transcended that, you see. That's those ignorant people back then. And we're much smarter and brighter and more enlightened. Okay. I say in that instance, we're simply falling right into the same trap. You see, we have to be aware of the spiritual war that's going on. And these forces are powerful and shrewd. Not little comical things, you know, haha, aren't they cute? Deadly, powerful, clever, evil, wicked, dangerous. We have to be alert. Okay, so here, they, but their idea, you know, they think they're just uh, the cat's pajamas. They're the epitome of this rationality and insight. And they are, see, the, the fact is in their ignorant dismissal and reviling of the spirits, what are they acting like? They're acting like unreasoning animals Creatures of mere instinct that lack the intelligence to avoid capture and destruction. They think they're great, and here they are. It's like a cow, you know, <laughs> just going along, and they're just being sucked right in. See, they're like unreasoning animals. They're just blind and stupid and just coming, and here they are, heading for the slaughter. And they have no clue about it. As wages of their unrighteousness, they're going to join the demons in the demon's destruction. 
when he says, reviling those about whom they are ignorant will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering harm as wages of unrighteousness. This is their fate. This is where they're headed. And so he's telling them, listen, what is he doing? He, he, all of this, you remember he said, listen, I, will, I want to do everything so that you will be prepared. I'll do all that I can now and to be sure even after I'm gone that you'll be encouraged and strengthened to be able to fight this. So he's pushing for it and he wants them to know. Now, these false teachers, they're so shameless that they have no qualms about indulging their sinful appetites in broad daylight. That's just an expression of these people. They don't care. Oh, you, the whole idea of morality, the whole notion, you're hung up. Are oh, you hung up on that? You see? They're just brazen about it. Because they're attacking the very concept that it's wrong. It's not wrong. Don't worry about these things. There's no penalty, no judgment. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. See, they're so shameless, they just go ahead and do this stuff out in the open without being ashamed, trying to hide it. They're proud of it. They're proud of how they're acting. And he says they're blots and blemishes in the church, living in sin while continuing to feast with the church. So here's the church has has these people and that when he talks about that they, they are feasting with the church, it's probably a reference to the early Christian love feast, which you see, which Jude mentions explicitly in Jude verse 12, and which is presupposed in Paul's rebuke of the, Christian, of, of the Christians in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. This notion of a love feast, it was a fellowship meal in conjunction with which the church often, if not always, celebrated the Lord's Supper proper, meaning the the symbolic bread and the fruit of the vine, at the end. But it would be connected here and tied. We'd have this love feast, this fellowship meal, and what's happening here? We've got these people here who are part of the church, embraced and accepted and sharing in the fellowship meal of the community. And they're sharks in the water. What are they doing? They're looking, they're going to go and grab people and persuade people and get them to join them in their immorality because they're deep. And so he's telling them, listen, these people here, they're shameless and yet here they are, they're blots and blemishes in the church, living in sin while continuing to feast with you. Now this love feast, it was a permissible rather than a commanded practice and it was separated from the supper by the second century and then was abandoned at least as a regular practice. But you have this thing as in Jude 12, you have this as part of the early church and here are these people among them. These people who are just living in sin and the church is just sitting here going, no, it's okay. Oh, no, that's fine. You just keep doing that and you, you come be part of us. Because after all, we wouldn't want to be you know, closed-minded about anything. And here they are, and they're sitting now in chapter 3, verse 14, Peter exhorts them, he exhorts his readers to be the opposite of the false teachers. See, whereas the false teachers, their blots and blemishes, he tells them that they are to strive to be found spotless and blameless. Blots and blemishes? How are you to be spotless and blameless? You see, you're to be the opposite of these people, not to be receiving them and bringing them and giving them access to the brothers and sisters. Now the false teachers have eyes full of desire for an adulteress. So these are dudes, by the way. Okay? They have eyes full of desire for an adulteress. That's what they're after. That's what, that's what they're interested in. And they don't cease from sin. They're always on the hunt for the next partner in adultery. Constantly viewing women from that perspective. That's what they do. They think, why not? Why not, right? I mean, there's no judgment. This whole idea of your moral standard judgment, you you know, don't get hung up on that. So what do they do? They're just cruising. They're, They're cruising, and that's how they're viewing all of the women they see. They're just trying to bed the women. And we think, oh, no, this is this is just a modern idea. Uh, you know, nobody, you know, back then everybody just, you know, they all just wore burlap and it was like this, and you could just peek in and and what do you think? People are people. Right? And this is what they were doing. 
And they justified it. They had a theological rationale for it. And they were just players. And he's saying, listen, this is insane. This is deadly. This is dangerous. This has to be stopped. And not only were they immoral, they were through their teaching. What are they doing? They're actively enticing and seducing spiritually unstable people to join them in their sin. They offered a theological rationale for their lawless living. So you see, you don't have to, you don't have to leave Christianity. No, 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 no. You don't have to do that. No, no, you can be. No, you're, I don't want anybody telling me I'm not a Christian. Who are you to say? I don't want anybody telling me I'm not a Christian. You see, I've, I've got this idea, this theology that says, look, be a Christian and sleep with everything that moves. Wow. Okay, do you see how that would may have get some traction with somebody? You see, I'm feeding what I'm feeding that sinful aspect that sits here and goes, ooh, let me see. Christianity, where I live a crucified life, Christianity, where I go wild. Hmm. You see? So what are they doing? They're enticing unstable people. They're pulling them away, and that's part of, see, they're not only immoral, they're not content to be privately immoral. They want to evangelize because they have this great insight that these people, the apostles, you know, they're all hung up and they're, they're you know, prudes and they don't know it right and they haven't got it. But, but the false teachers do. And they're telling them. And they're pulling people and they're winding up killing people. He tells them that, they, that false teachers have hearts trained in greed. Now that's a good shot, isn't it? Trained in greed, meaning they'd worked at developing hearts that desired without proper restraint. You know, they're like, you know, doing a workout. It took, it took effort to get to this point. They have hearts that are, that are trained in greed. They desire without proper restraint hearts that put money and sexual pleasure above God. So he's after them. You see, and there are times when things have to be said directly and clearly because that is what it means to love people. You see? It is not loving to allow sharks to swim among the brothers and sisters, devouring them because you think that it will make you look, well, if I just come out and say that that's heresy and that's wrong and that has to stop, well, that makes me look bad. Well, that's, that love calls for that. As you see that, the Spirit of God in Peter uh, telling them exactly that. He says, they're accursed children, meaning they're destined for condemnation. And then he says that these heretics, they follow Balaam's way of disobedience to God for the sake of financial profit. So you remember he talked about them being greedy. Somehow they have a, a gain, some financial gain somehow in this. And so he says, look, these guys, they follow Balaam's way of disobedience to God for financial profit. He gave advice on how to lure the Israelites into sexual immorality at Baal Peor. That was his little deal here where he sits here and he says, no, I got the trick. I know how you can pull these Israelites into sexual immorality. You can see that in Numbers 25, 1 to 3, 31, 7 and 8, 31, 15 and 16. Now, that effort there at Baal Peor of luring the Israelites into sexual immorality was connected in Jewish, in Jewish tradition with his greed. That he was hoping and, you know, he was going to get something out of it. Jesus described Balaam to John in Revelation 2.14 as one who, quote, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. And what are these guys doing that Peter's writing about? That's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to encourage the church to practice sexual immorality by jettisoning the idea that there's going to be a consummating return and a judgment. Forget all that. Parte. Live how you want. Kick that idea loose. These false teachers were likewise are seeking to lure the church just like he did. Now, let me say a little bit about this tradition of Balaam and his greed. It's rooted in, in Jewish tradition. I think it may, it may have its deepest roots in Numbers 22, where you can see hints that he was motivated by the hope of financial gain. But sometimes, you know, that's a difficult text, by the way. It looks like in Numbers 22 that God tells Balaam to go with these emissaries of Balak, and then he goes, and then God's angry with him. And you're like going, didn't he just tell him to go? 
And then he has the angel, you remember, standing there in the, in the passageway there and all that. So it's difficult. Let me give you a take, uh, Walter Kaiser's take, from his book, Hard Sayings of, of the Old Testament. And basically, you have these emissaries, they come, and first time they come, and he goes and talks, uh, uh, Balaam talks to God, and he says, no, that's it, see ya. And then they return with even greater, they return with even greater promises and this kind of thing, so his hope for cash is, is more. And he tells these emissaries, he says, you guys wait here, and I'm going to go talk to God. And it depends on how you translate and understand verse 20, but the idea that Kaiser uh, uses and I think makes some sense it's that listen what God really says to Balaam in that instance is if after you've put them off by telling them to go and wait until you talk to me spend the night if they return to you after that then you can go with them and then Balaam doesn't wait for them he takes the initiative and he goes despite their not having returned to him Okay, that, you have to translate uh, one of those verses the way it's translated in the King James. So, I mean, under that idea, you see that he was not willing to allow that possibility that they wouldn't come, and he then jumped the gun and took the initiative and go with them, and then, it's, then right after that, as they're going, what do you have? Then you have, he says, God's displeased with him. Okay, I think that's what's going on there. Now, despite Balaam's disobedience, God in his mercy, he doesn't kill him, right? He allows the donkey... To see the angel. So here he is. He's acting in defiance somehow with an impure motive. Whether you accept Kaiser's uh, view that I just tried to sketch for you. Or something else. He's acting with an impure motive. And he goes there. And God allows the donkey to see the angel. And the donkey possessed sounder prophetic vision than the prophet whose moral sense had been perverted by greed. And you remember the whole thing. Oh, you believe in a talking donkey? Do you think God can't have a donkey talk? These people, it's like, well, I had a guy years ago, I told you, he said, oh, if Jesus came here, I, I said, I say, you know, if Jesus, you know, all things are made through him. I said, if he made everything, you telling me he couldn't walk on water? He told me, no, if he came here, you have to obey the law of physics. I just shaking my head. I said, this is like crazy, man. You don't understand. He, he's, he made it. So I'm thinking, he made the donkey. Can he make the donkey talk? That's impossible. That's crazy. I'm going to have an, all right, I, I don't have much patience for that kind of thing. God wants his donkey to talk. The donkey's talking, and he could sing opera. If he wanted that donkey to sing, he'd sing. But this donkey winds up rebuking him. First he goes in the field, and all, then he goes down, and he's beating him, and he says, Hey, what are you beating me for? So he stops, he allows the donkey to see it, and there's this encounter with the angel who warns Balaam in 22.35, Numbers 22.35, That he has to speak only what he's told. And after having been chastened, he refused to curse Israel, but instead blessed them four times. So I think that's what's going on. But in any event, you see here, Balaam here, Peter uses, when he sits here and he says, uh, he's followed the way of Balaam, son of Basar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So they are obviously, they're doing this. He's already talked about their greed. They're doing this somehow for some financial gain. Now, Peter's reference to Balaam as the son of Basar is kind of puzzling because he's a son of Beor. And most people think that what's probably going on here is that there's a word play from the Hebrew word for flesh, which is Basar. Okay, so they think this is, this is probably, depending on how you pronounce an Omicron here in the Greek, but anyway, they think that's probably what's going on, is that you have Basar in Hebrew and, and this Basar, son of Basar. So he's saying that he's not spiritual, he's of the flesh. Okay, that's because a lot of people wonder, where in the world does he get this from? All right, 2.17 to 22, he says, these men are water. He's not through. (laughs) He's not through. And I just look at this, and you see how how much energy the Spirit of God pours into warning the brothers and sisters about this danger. He says, these men are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved. While uttering high-sounding words of nonsense, They entice with lusts of the flesh, acts of licentiousness, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error, promising them freedom while themselves being slaves of corruption. For by what someone has been overcome, to this he has become enslaved. For if after escaping the pollutions of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 
they are overcome by a, they they are overcome by again becoming entangled in these things the last state has become worse for them than the first for it was better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn from the holy commandment that had been passed on to them it has happened to them according to the true proverb a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after being washed to wallowing in the mud ooh <laughs> I say ooh on that. We're talking serious here. Now, Peter, he describes these false teachers first as waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. Now, both metaphors describe circumstances that suggest the provision of refreshing and life giving water, but which turn out to be false and therefore very disappointing. You see, you can see it clearly with waterless springs. I'll say something about mist driven by a storm in a second. But right, you have, you, you're, you're out here, you're parched, you're coming to this spring, you're there, here it is, it's going to deliver something that's refreshing and life-giving and good, and what it, eh, empty. Bitterly disappointing. So I think both of the metaphors make that point. Now the mist driven by a storm, it probably refers to mist that are dissipated or blown away by winds without producing any rainfall. Here they are, and it looks like this is a harbinger that there's going to be something, and all of a sudden, <laughs> gone. Here's what Schreiner says on it. He says, the mist, promote, the, or the mist promise water that is so desperately needed in a dry climate, but the wind sweeps through and drives the hazy mist away, leaving the land parched. See, these false teachers, what do they do? They promise the, the refreshing and life-giving truth of God, right? This is what they're claiming. We have the truth of God. These apostles who are telling you these doctrines and things, they're not right. We have the truth, and here it is. The Word of God, refreshing and life-giving. And any who go to them will wind up empty, bitterly disappointed because there's nothing there. You see, there's nothing there, and that's just exactly how they are. Now, he describes the judgment Ah, you got to stick for five more minutes. He describes the judgment that's in store for them as the gloom of darkness. The gloom of darkness. It reminds me, by the way, Meg and I were somewhere, and actually years ago, we were in Canada, and the lights went out in this hotel. And I'm telling you, I opened the, I opened the door, and all the electricity went off, and this place was out in the mountains, and I opened this door into this hallway, and you talk about black. I couldn't tell I'd opened the door. I mean, it was like, you know, this was like crazy. You know, I've never seen something like that. But they're going to be, he describes them what's in store for them as the gloom of darkness. They will for eternity suffer in a dreadful environment away from the presence of God and all that is good. Now, can you imagine that? Away from the presence of God and all that is good. Now, other, other texts, of course, it portrays judgment how? As fire. Right? Other texts portray judgment as fire, but both depictions are true because neither depiction is intended to be a literal description. Okay, what they're intended to be is a picture that communicates the truth of suffering and dreadfulness. So whatever the particulars, whatever the manifestation, what you cannot miss from these symbols and pictures is it's the ultimate bummer. It is, it is a place when, I, when you can describe something as fire and always this idea of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, what is that? That's like somebody just going, oh, oh. Okay, that's not a pretty picture. Okay? And it is, it is portrayed differently. Shut out from the presence of God. Fire. Gloomy darkness. You are away from all that is good. And it is an absolutely horrible existence. And we do people no favors, in my judgment, by concealing that from them. Because we say, you know, if you talk about hell, if you talk about judgment, we're just not, people aren't going to put up, well, what do you do? <laughs> do we have to devise a way here to talk about the Bible without talking about that? So as not to offend people? Maybe they need to hear it. And what do I do with somebody if I, if I tell them the truth and they say, well, I'm not going to accept that. What do I do? I remember years ago, we're going back, I had a Bible study in my office with a, a lady. And we were studying about uh, Romans chapter 1. We were studying on homosexuality. 
she asked me what I thought about it, and I said, here, read this. And she was sitting across from me at the desk, and she started reading. And when she got to the part where it was clear what Paul was saying about God's condemnation, she closed the book and said, I don't accept that. I said, well, I didn't say it. <laughs> See, I didn't say that. You were reading what God has said. Now, I can't make you accept anything. But I can certainly be somebody who spreads the truth. And what you do with it is up to you. But here in this place, in this context, Peter is telling him, he describes what's in store for him. They will endure that fate because they're opposing God by luring immature Christians, those barely escaping from the pull of the world, by luring them into a lifestyle of sexual sin. Now, I think of, I think of our world this way. I don't know, I'm sure there are Christian strands that do this. But I just think of the world. What is it doing with our young people? We wonder about young people and all that. Look at the culture we're in. Look at the culture. All it says to people, the only thing that matters in life is sex. That's the essence of life. And that's coming in every angle, every show, every movie, magazines, the culture. If you're young, that's what it means to be hip. And it's just pulling them and pulling them and pulling them. You see? And so here we have, what do we have teachers here? What are they doing? They're, it's the same thing from within the church. Saying to these people, listen, come this way. I have the angle that promises you you can claim Christ and you can live any way you want. Okay? Well, this is what's happening in the world here. Uh, you're just, being, just pulling the people. They promise them freedom. Okay, meaning freedom from moral restraints. But the reality and irony is what? That they themselves are enslaved to sin. They're enslaved to moral corruption, especially to their sinful sexual appetites. They are being ruled by those. They have no power in their lives. What are they doing? They're out looking around for, who can I commit adultery with next? I don't care. I don't care what it does to her, him, me, anybody, the cause of Christ. I don't care. It's all about me. I can just see them rooting around, you know, rooting around like an animal. They're absolutely captured. And they got the chutzpah to be telling somebody, I've got freedom for you. You got nothing for me. You got nothing. You're a slave. And you're trying to pull these people in. And God is having none of it. Thanks for coming.